Next week, Calling All Cars will be heard at a new time, 7 to 7.30 on Tuesday night, and each Tuesday night at that time thereafter. Copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Oakland Police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 302 regarding a murder. The victim refused to give any description of suspect. That's all. Rose and Clay. possibility of a higher cost of living, I'd like to say a few words about the lower cost of better motoring. There's only one way for you and Rio Grande's revolutionary gasoline to become friends, and that is to try it. It stands to reason that if the best authority, those who buy the most, drive the most, use and endorse this great new gasoline, it will also work best in your car. The operators of police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other public service equipment were the first to prove the amazing response, smooth acceleration, tremendous power, and additional mileage of this radically new gasoline. When you drive into your nearest red and white Rio Grande station in the morning, you'll agree with these men and the army of motorists that Rio Grande Crack is the most highly recommended gasoline of public service sold in the West. around which tonight's story has been written were taken from the files of the Oakland Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief Bodie Wallman of Oakland to prepare a foreword to our program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be a guest of Calling All Cars once more and to reiterate the theme of this program. The story tonight goes back to 1919, when there was more or less gambling in many cities throughout the United States. Today, I am happy to say that there is comparatively few gambling houses operating in our great country. For years, our department has weeded out these undesirable places which hatch crime. We shall hear tonight of a story in which the perpetrators of a crime left absolutely no trace, yet they were known to their victims from the start. The unwillingness of those victims to identify the killers greatly hampered the police. Today we get much better cooperation on the part of the citizens. Nevertheless, in spite of obstacles and lack of cooperation, the criminal will learn always that crime cannot pay. down in the Pacific Ocean on the Philippine Islands. Men in Pati are engaged in target practice. Hot dog, there's another. Hell, you sure am hitting them today. <laughs> I got a good reason for being so good. Yeah, I know. Me too. Now, look here. You watch this. You ain't so bad yourself. <laughs> but you ain't seen nothing yet. Watch this. Mm-hmm. A bull's eye sure is out a foot high. You sure is getting good. Just you wait till we get back to the state. Just you wait. And now we skip several months. Our scene shifts to Oakland, California. It is almost 2 o'clock on Sunday morning, August 3rd, 1919. Police headquarters. Inspector Gallagher speaking. This is Patrolman Garcia. I'm out in the color section. Yeah. Hey, you better get out here pronto. There's a whole house full of dead people. Uh, oh, hey, what's the address? Uh, 1733 Gossip. For the love of Mike, hurry. That must be the house. 
Right there. Flash your light up on that door. Yeah, this is it. 1733. And look, the door's wide open, too. Let's go. Yeah, I wonder where Garcia is. I thought he'd be out in front to meet us. You don't suppose he's hit, too, do you? How'd he sound over the phone? Like he was hit? No, just sort of scared or worried. Not quite natural. Funny, the door's still open. Yeah. It's so dark in this hallway. You can't... Hey, listen. Did you hear what I heard? Yeah. Sounded like it came from over there. Flash your light around. Must have come from behind that door. Come on. Where the devil is Garcia? We'll know soon. I'll be back at that door. Get your gun ready. All right. Open the door carefully. Okay. Well, I'll be done. Garcia. Oh, thank heaven you got here, Inspector. This is a terrible mess. You sure gave us a scare. We thought you were dead. Why didn't you meet us out in front? Oh, I'm sorry, Inspector. These people are hurt pretty bad. I've been dressing their wounds. Good Lord, what a mess. What happened? An army walked through here and have target practice? I don't know, Inspector McSorley. This is pretty much the way I found everything. And I called an ambulance. Speak easy, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Furniture broken, tables overturned, and blood. Say, how on earth did that blood get on the walls and the floor? I don't know, sir. Must have been quite a fight. Well, let's get down to business. Who are all these people? I don't know. I've been too busy trying to bandage them and administer first aid. The one over there in the expensive-looking tuxedo seems to be about done for. Yes, sir. Uh, who's the girl crying over? I don't that know. That mighty good-looking girl. Sorry, man, I'm trying to find us some. Yes, sir. Those two men in the corner don't seem to be so hard hit. All right, young lady. What's this all about? Please go away and leave me alone. Arthur, please tell me. Arthur, please tell me. I thought Garcia said there was a house full of dead people. These all seem to be alive. He was probably a little bit startled. What's your name? Arthur. Arthur, please tell me. Now, listen, lady. I know how you must feel, but he's hurt bad, and I've got to know how it happened. Now, please, tell me what your name is. Is you police? Yes. Oh, well, my name's Helen Moore. Get that, Dick. Got it. What's your address? This is my home. I live here. This is a speakeasy, isn't it? Yes, I run it. What's his name? <laughs> what well, you call him, Arthur? Arthur what? Arthur Woodyard. He live here, too? No. Okay. Now, then, what happened? Who did this? Well, we don't know. Say, listen, buddy, you're in a bad way. Now, tell us who did this. Give us a statement before it's too late. We don't I'll tell you how it happened. Shut I... up, shut up. Arthur, please. We don't know nothing about it. Okay, okay. Better treat him careful, Miss Moore. <laughs> he has no longer lived. What's the use? That's the trouble with these speak murders. That was an underworld job and nobody will talk. Maybe we can get something out of the other two. I doubt it. They're all scared half to death. We'll try, though. Let's try the little one first. Yeah. Uh, we're from police headquarters. We have to have your name. Uh, my, my name's Sexton. Sam Sexton. But, but I don't know nothing about it. Uh, honest, I don't uh, I don't know nothing. Yeah. Uh, you, what's your name? Thomas Filer. What do you know about this? I ain't got nothing to say. I was afraid of that. Yeah, me too. Now, listen, both of you. That man over there is in a bad condition. I doubt if he lives through the rest of the night. And that means that he's been murdered. Do you understand? Murdered? Yes, and furthermore, somebody's going to have to pay for it. Sam, you better tell us what you know about this. There's going to be a serious charge placed against somebody. Which yards about gone. Murder calls for a lot of explaining. I don't know, officer. I cloud them. I we don't know nothing but does this thing. Nope, nothing. Okay. The ambulance is pulling up out in front. Well, we'll put Woodyard and the girl in that, and these two can ride the patrol wagon. They're not so badly hurt. And as soon as they're all gone, you and I'll try to re reconstruct this crime. <laughs> victims were taken away, and the two detectives made a rapid but thorough search of the house, then sat down to try and determine how the shooting occurred. Let's see now. The killer must have been known here, or Helen Moore wouldn't let him in. Even though this place is in the color station, it's exclusive. Yeah. Say, uh, do you notice anything about that picture over there? Sure. A bunch of swell-looking dames. What is it, a harem scene? Yeah, but uh, take another look. I didn't know you were a night critic. Well, I'm not. But there's a mole on one of the girl's legs that doesn't look very much like... By George, that's what it is. Hey, what's the matter with you? What are you taking it down for? That's not a mole, it's a bullet hole. Huh? Yeah, and here's a slug in the wall. I'll have it dug out in a minute. I'm going to call you little bright eyes. My golly, if there's one on the wall, there must be several more. Maybe, yeah. Uh, here's one in the leg of this table. He used a thirty-eight revolver. Here's a slug. 
have this one out in a minute. He sure must have gone hog wild. And just between you and me, the motive wasn't robbery. What did you say your slug came from? A thirty-eight revolver? Yeah. Well, apparently the killer used two guns. A thirty-eight revolver and a thirty-two automatic. A thirty-two automatic? Yeah. Well, that doesn't make sense. There isn't one gunman in a thousand who uses two different kinds of guns. All two gun men use the same make and caliber. Yeah, and furthermore, this place is too much in the shambles for one guy to have done it. Well, that's point number two. There were two or more killers. They must have been known to gain entrance. And another thing, Woodyard was their target. He's hurt bad, and I'll bet intentionally. I've been thinking the same thing. Whoever the gunmen were, they came here with the express intention of killing Woodyard. Robbery was secondary. The Moore woman and the other two men were hit by stray bullets. Yeah. It's certain the two men were. The woman got in the way. Don't forget the picture of Woodyard on her dresser upstairs. She's got a case on him. Yeah, that's true. She probably tried to shield Woodyard. Why don't we try to reconstruct the thing? I'll be one of the killers and you the other. Eh? Sure. I used to be able to recite some Shakespeare. I guess I haven't forgotten how to act. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. We start at the front door. Now, whoever we are, we came up and rang the doorbell. Helen Moore wants to come to the door. Well, look who's here. Come on in and bring your buddies with you. Just in time. Betty Jane's on here. We would have greeted her and gone in. She'd have led us down the hall into that door over there and brought us in here. Now, you boys, just make yourself at home. What's your name? Now, if we knew her, and we must have, we'd have exchanged a few pleasantries. We'd have probably have answered in the abstract, and if, as we suspect, the killers were familiar with Woodyard, would have inquired about him. Oh, yeah, Arthur's just fine. There he is over there. Come on over and say hello. Hey, Arthur, there's a couple of old friends dropped in to say hello to you. Oh, hello there, boys. Glad to see you. How you been? We would answer, all right. Want to do a little drinking tonight? We'd answer, maybe, and walk over to where Arthur was stationed. Make yourself at home, boys. I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, gentlemen, the place is yours. About now is when we began, isn't it? Yeah, we'd both whip out our guns, and if this was a grudge killing, tell Woodyard we'd come to get him. Now, listen, boys, there ain't no use for guns around here. We can settle this thing peacefully. Yeah, we'd say it couldn't be settled. Wait a minute, don't yeah. shoot. We can straighten this whole thing out. What's going on over here? Oh, good Lord, don't shoot him. It wasn't his fault. We'd tell her to keep out of it, you and, You ain't going to uh, get nothing by killing us. So take the money and clear out of here. We won't even say nothing to the cops. Honest, we won't. That's right. That's right. Take the money. Maybe the killers figured they got fleeced and wanted to get even. Huh? Let the past go. Forget it. Take this money and figure everything square. Or maybe the girl was the reason. Yeah, there ain't no reason to dig up the past. I didn't mean no harm. Honest, I didn't. I, I cared just as much for you as I always did, but you see, I never really loved you. I loved Arthur. By this time, we'd probably have had enough words and tell the old woman to get out of the way. And you don't know what you're doing. You can't both hang with this. You can both hang you can't kill a man and get away with it. Get out of the way, Eleanor. You'll get it, too. There must be some way to settle this without... Get killing. out of the way. Your number's up, Woodyard. <laughs> oh, you get it! You get it! Oh, The other killer would have let go just to be sure Woodyard was dead. There was probably several other shots fired in an attempt to shoot up the joint. And that's how the other two got hit. Uh -huh. Most of the others would have scrambled out as best they could. Yeah, one of the killers would have scooped up the dough and the two of them beat it. A wild exodus of customers, the furniture got over. Or else Woodard put up a fight. Don't forget that possibility. Yeah, that's right. Well, after they'd all gone, just the four of them were left. Woodyard, weak but not dead, would have sworn the rest to secrecy. <laughs> the deserted streets, Gallagher and McSorley drove to the Skull Tavern, garish and weird, catacomb-like food lined the walls, and from black coffins, loosely jointed skeletons grinned at passers-by. Savage rhythm boomed incessantly from drums on the low stage. The two detectives seated themselves uneasily in a skull festooned booth. So, oh, this is the famous Skull Tavern. First time I've ever been in it. Yeah? Well, I was here once before. Say, um, how do you like the musicians? Gruesome looking bunch. What do they have on? Black tights with skeletons fitted on? Well, it looks like it. It's those grotesque masks that get me. Yeah. So you notice how they beat those drums in units of three while the others circulate through the crowd? Yeah, quite an idea. I suppose they go among the guests. Sure. There'll be one over here in this way in a few minutes. Yeah? <laughs> Say, there's quite a few white people here. Yeah. Entertainers from other night spots that close early and a few stragglers from uptown out slumming. 
Oh, oh here comes the waiter. What you going to have? You mean that guy in the undertaker's outfit is a waiter? Sure. Some... Yeah, huh? Yeah. All right, gentlemen, uh, what you all going to have? Well, I'll take the uh, Welsh rabbit and a cup of coffee. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, and I'll take the same, I guess. <laughs> Give me your worst nightmare. Uh, yes, sir. Coming right up, sir, right? Fine place you brought me to. And probably serve as embalming fluid. Don't kid yourself, Tom. You'll get the best cup of coffee you ever had. And besides, I uh, didn't bring you here just for coffee. No? No. Just sit tight and pin your ears back, and I'll show you something. Okay. Say, you see those two men in uniform over the far corner? Yeah, I've been watching them. Got more girls around them you can shake a stick at. Why, how women go for the uniform of the U.S. Army. Yeah, they're spending all their pay in one night. Tomorrow, Uh-oh. they won't... Here comes one of those drummers. What do we have to do, buy him a drink? Nah, just wait and see. Evil-looking specimen with that mask on. Good evening, Inspector. Oh, you look pretty good. Uh, can you sit down for a few minutes? Sure. What is all this? Who is this man, Dick? <laughs> Should we tell him? Sure. What do we got to lose? Lift your mask up a second and let Tom take a quick look. you have to make it quick. There. Sanderson. Big as life and twice as that. <laughs> this is Inspector Sanderson's regular racket. Yeah. He works here at the tavern all the time as a drummer. No one knows he's a police <laughs> officer. I'll have to be getting back to my drums in a few minutes. What you got on your mind? Now, there's been a little trouble down on Gore Street tonight. Gore Street? Not Helen Moore's place. Yeah, how'd you know? I'm Mr. tonight. He comes in here almost every night with Arthur Woodard. Then you know him too. Yeah. Is he mixed up in it? Yeah, he's got a couple of slugs in him. Doubt if he lives till daylight. What about Miss Moore? Oh, just a slight flesh wound in the shoulder. There are a couple of others mixed up in it. Do you know a Sam Sexton and a Thomas Farley? Yes. The Sexton boy has just come here from the south. Well, Farley's a local man. Neither one's been in any trouble before that I know of. Well, what about Woodyard? I don't know much about him. Always been sort of a mystery. But what happened? We don't exactly know. None of them will talk. The place is in a shambles and the money's all gone. But me and Dick have an idea there's more behind it all than robbery. I wouldn't be surprised. Would you not more girl have been going around together for some time? There might be a motive in that. That's what we thought. Robbery was probably secondary. Yeah. Well, I'll see you have to go over and whack on my drum again. I'll go right to work on it, though, and see what I can find. I hear a lot of funny things sitting behind this mess. And he's not kidding. On Wednesday, August 6th, Gallagher and McCauley conferred with the autopsy surgeon. What's the report, Doctor? Well, the hospital staff did everything it could to save Woodyard, but he was too badly hurt. When did he die? This morning. Is the autopsy over yet? Yes, we finished less than an hour ago. Here it is. Hmm. 138 and 132 bullets found, eh? Yes. One of them was a revolver bullet, and the other was from an automatic. That was what we had figured before. That proved to me that there were two men in on this. Yes, uh, I'm rather inclined to agree with you. You see, the path followed by the bullets leads me to believe that the slugs were fired from two entirely different positions. Besides, as a precaution against getting his ammunition mixed, a two-gun man practically always uses guns that are alike. Well, Gallagher, it looks like you'll have to finish up this case with Tom Wood. I've got to take over another case this afternoon. Okay by me. Well, thanks, Doctor. Mind if we take these slugs along with us? Not at all. Maybe you'll find a gun or two to compare them with. A few days later, Inspector Sanderson called on Helen Moore, who was convalescing. But can't you understand, Miss Moore? It's the law's job to take care of cases like this. They ain't done to tell, Inspector Sanderson. Uh, you ain't got no idea who the men were? I ain't never seen them before. Why well, come you let them in if you didn't know them? I thought you was pretty particular. Well, I is, but that night business was bad and I needed customers. And what'd they look like? How were they dressed? Looked just like any other soldier. Soldiers? Huh? So, they were soldiers. Did I say that? Yes. Well, I meant they were soldiers of fortune. Well, did you ever know any of them before? No. What branch of the army were they in? Who said anything about them being in the army? Now, looky here, Miss Moore. We ain't getting no place like this. You know who those men were and why they came to kill Woody. Now, why don't you tell me the whole story? It's the duty of the police department to take care of killers. If you carry out your intention of settling the score yourself, then you will be a murderer and liable to arrest. You may be 
Hanging? Our people have enough trouble as it is. You don't want that to happen, do you? I ain't gonna kill nobody. Maybe not, but you'll have it done. And if the boys you get to do it is caught, and you know they're gonna get caught, it'll come out that you got them to do it. And that makes you guilty. Don't you see? I'm trying to help you. Now, why don't you help me? Help me to bring Arthur Woodge's murderers to justice. Well... I was going to tell the cops when they first come here, but Arthur made me promise not. I know, but he didn't realize that you might be branded as a murderer yourself. Maybe, hey, why, if he'd have thought it out, or he, he'd want you to tell. Well, all right, Inspector, I'll tell you. Yeah, they were soldiers in Uncle Sam's army, and there was two of them, and I know them. They come here to get even with Arthur for something they figured he'd done three years ago. I guess it was a little jealous and mixed up in it, too. Well, do you know the names of the men? Yeah, you said you knew them. Yeah, I know the names. Uh, where can we find them? Well, they ought to be at the Presidio in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Suppose you tell me exactly what took place. Well, it was about midnight a little after, and I answered the door, and there they stood, the two of them. First, I didn't know whether to let them in or not, but... I decided it was best to act like everything was all right. So I let him in, and a little while later... Helen Moore poured out the whole story to Inspector Sanderson, who in turn got in touch with Tom Gallagher at headquarters. Homicide. Gallagher speaking. Listen, Tom. I've got to talk fast. I'm falling from a skull cabin. I don't want no one to get wise. What's on your mind, Sanderson? Your case is sold up. It's in the bag. Nice. All you have to do is make the arrest. Yeah, but arrest who? Well, you and Tom Wood jump in a taxi and pick up Helen Moore at her house. She'll be waiting for you, and she'll tell you where to go. Has she decided to talk? I ain't got time to explain, but she'll show you what to do after you pick her up. Okay, we're on the way. Now just follow her lead. She'll help you out. Thanks, Sandy. Nice going. Bye. This is Inspector Tom Wood. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Moore? Well, where to, Miss Moore? Down to the fair and cross over to San Francisco, then over to the Presidio. You mean there's some soldiers mixed up in this? Yes. You know them? No, I ain't never seen them before in my life. Uh, how do you know we'll be able to find them at the Presidio? In the issue, I reckon. I've been told I was psychic. Did Woodyard know them? No. Why didn't he want the police to know anything about it? I don't know. He never gained consciousness, so I didn't get there. Do you have any idea what the motive might have been? No, I don't. Robbery, I suppose. Are you sure there wasn't anything else back of it? I don't know nothing except what I told you, so don't ask me no more questions. I don't know nothing. There's two soldiers, and the best place to find soldiers is at the Presidio. Okay, Miss Moore. Maybe we can get the real reason out of the killers if we find them. Well, that's a mighty bit of pill to take, Inspector. I hate to think that any of my boys would commit murder. Well, we haven't any definite proof. All we know is that there were two soldiers that Miss Moore says she's sure she can pick them out of the whole army. I'll tell you what. It's time for roll call, and the men will be lined up outside. I'll accompany you, and we'll inspect the whole regiment if need be. That's mighty nice of you, Colonel McDonald. I don't know whether the girl can pick out the men or not, but she seems to think so. Seems to me like a pretty big order. Come along. We can start with the Negro cavalry regiment. Good idea. Somehow I got a hunch we won't find our men. There's something mighty mysterious about all this. Inspector Sanderson phoned and said the case is open and shut and to get Helen Moore and follow her instructions. He acted like he knew all about it, and yet the girl doesn't act like she knows a thing. Uh, maybe Sanderson promised not to betray her confidence. Yeah, I thought of that. Okay, Ward. Bring this Moore up here. Might as well start at this end and work through the ranks. Okay. Quite all right. All set. It won't take long. All right. Let's get started. There's one of them. You seem awful positive, Miss Moore. I never forget faces. A private John Martin? Two paces forward. Look. 
There's the other one down there. Private Ernest Stikes, two paces forward. Sergeant, yes, place sir. these men in the guardhouse. As soon as officers Gallagher and Wood could get back to headquarters, they obtained warrants, and the prisoners were moved from the Presidio guardhouse to the Oakland City Jail. Thomas Farley and Sam Sexton confirmed Helen Moore's testimony. The hardware store was located where the two guns had been purchased and the ring of evidence tightened. In the meantime, the soldiers solidly refused to confess. Finally, Martin, when threatened with the prospect of hanging for his part in the crime, gave in. You see, uh, he was all at Helen's place about three years ago. This wayward fellow was working there, and before he left, where well, he took all our money with him. We planned all three years we was in the Philippine Islands how we was going to get even with him. Is that all, Martin, that motivated you to get even with Woodyard for taking your money? Weren't you in love with Miss Moore? Well, I'll answer that off. Oh, so it was you, Dykes, that was in love with Miss Moore. Yeah, it was me, all right. We'll find out sooner or later anyway. Well, she told me over for Woodyard. Then he had the nerve to fleece us out of dough. I planned for three years I was going to get him. Used to take my target practice serious. So I come to Helen's house that night just to kill him. Martin must have got sight of me, fired his gun. I was to do all the shooting myself. Helen tried to interfere and got a slug in the shoulder. A couple of stray ones hit six and farther. That's all there is to it. But I'm glad he's dead. If I had to do it over again, I'd do the same thing. I'm just sorry now that I didn't kill Helen, too. But if I ever gets out of here, I'll kill her so help me. In just a moment, we shall hear the concluding facts regarding our program. Technically, an officer of the law works a certain number of hours, then goes off duty. But in reality, he's always on the job. And all-purpose Rio Grande crack is like that. No matter what this strikingly different gasoline is called upon to do, let the weather change from hot to cold, regardless of the temperature or traffic conditions, you can depend upon all-purpose Rio Grande crack to live up to its reputation as the most highly endorsed gasoline in the West. Aided by the formerly reluctant victims, officials brought Martin and Dykes to trial. They were found guilty and sentenced to spend the remainder of their lives in San Quentin. Attention all cards, cancellation broadcast 302 regarding a murder. Suspects this case are now in custody. That's all. Oh, you will.